Every year, Hamilton Native Outpost has a field day to share knowledge of native plants. Amy Hamilton shared her observations about how various plants have root systems that are shaped differently and how this benefits a native grassland. This field day focused on grazing diverse native grasslands with livestock, but the information presented here can be useful to anyone interested in native plants. Amy is co-owner of Hamilton Native Outpost and has been studying native grasslands since the 1980s. In the description, check out other videos from the field day. Now we join the field day as Amy is introducing the concept of thinking about a grassland below ground. You know, how we can fill the solar collector and do more photosynthesis with diversity above ground, but we really don't think too much about what's going on underground. So that's kind of what I would like to uh, open up to you guys today, what some of these different plants are doing. So one of the first plants that I want to talk about is the sunflowers. So there's a, a Maximilian sunflower and a sawtooth sunflower, and they're, they're the big plants right out in there. Uh, the taller plants right there, that we ended up with a great stand of these in our first diverse natives for grazing planting that we did. And, you know, any cowboy can tell those really don't look all that herbaceous like they would make the great, like make the best grazing material. But as I've been on this journey through, you know, trying to understand uh, plants and where they fit in and how it affects the soil, uh, that is, my background is in agronomy. I got out of college. Learning organic matter was wonderful stuff. But, you know, I went to work for 40 years and never thought about it again. So we kind of come back and I've got the textbook out again. And, you know, looking at, at organic matter, which is a good, uh, you know, it's a good indication of a healthy soil, the more organic matter that you have in it. So there's three reasons you might want sunflowers and the above ground reason that you might want these sunflowers is uh, as the cattle graze around the stems they do eat the lower they eat the leaves they don't eat the stems but these remaining stems with a few uh, leaves up ahead make overhead protection from dive bombing uh, hawks and whatnot as you know on quail so quail uh, will feed in these open areas that we've grazed. They like an open grassland uh, that's been grazed down, especially for brood rearing habitat for the little quail. They don't do very good on a wet morning going through the heavy dew. So this, this grazing makes good habitat for these little quail chicks to go through and this overhead protection then, then protects them. And then the wildlife people just love the edge that we create, you know, around these grazed areas when we leave little areas ungrazed so that quail can get into those and, and hide from predators a little bit better, predators that may be on the ground. So that's just looking at, you know, what that plant does from a little bit different perspective. The second reason is, as we learned yesterday, the stems on, on that plant uh, are quite substantial and they don't break down very fast. So they had this stem out here yesterday of one of the one of the sunflowers that from last year. So and this cover on the ground, it's just really important to maintaining healthy soils. So it makes that long lasting cover that breaks down slowly on the ground. And the third reason I, that you might want this sunflower I've saved for last is uh, is really its woody root system. So I went out and dug some of these plants yesterday so that I could show these woody root systems to you guys. And what you find out is these dark brown roots right here are actually last year's roots. So they had stems attached to them. That brown stem would be attached to it here this year if we had that if I could t get that out, you'll see that has a brown stem there on it, where these other ones are green and growing stems. So we have these different, we have these living roots that are coming off of these brown roots. So these roots are regenerating themselves is what they're doing. This here root is dying and was regenerating with these other roots. So the importance of these re regenerating roots is important to the soil. So when we have roots that are living and dying in the soil, 
they're adding to that organic matter in the soil is what they're doing and you may say well annuals do that too and biannuals do that and they do annuals and biannuals those roots are dying either yearly or every other year adding organic matter to the soil but that system is a little more unstable depending on whether we get rain is that seed going to germinate um, you know so they're just a little bit more unstable than what this perennial so this here is a perennial and it comes back you know from this root every year some perennials don't regenerate a root and I would like to it would be fun to go over some of these coefficient values and to think about are these perennials like a coneflower they don't regenerate their roots okay so that makes them more stable there's an energy use into regenerating this root and not only and there's also a value to the soil with these regenerative roots so as we as we think about plants that's another thing that that we can kind of begin to think about so there is an importance to woody roots in our systems so we as grazers don't think much of anything woody is very good we look at that and we think oh don't need that um, so but in i got the textbook out because i have been interested in how do we make long-term organic matter so visualize uh but just visualize a white clover plant and that real herbaceous plant up above the ground here. Well, guess what? Its root systems kind of look the same. It's really herbaceous. You know, it's not very woody. It's just, just you know, pretty soft, tender roots. So these roots and the plant up above, too, all the nitrogen in that system around that white clover, nitrogen uh, in the system degrades very quickly so when we have that nitrogen in the soft tissue the, the bacteria build up in numbers bacteria can build up real quick and then they break down that that um, mass all that all that material is then broken down fairly quickly and it's cycled in the system and that is good cycling these nutrients is important in our systems but we don't want all those types of roots in our systems either there's a value the value to this woody root is this woody root decays very quick very slowly it the the sugars and the more starchy components are eaten out of this root but the 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 more lignified plant material is left there in that structure you know somewhat making a sponge for a longer amount of time and then as this woody plant material uh, gets uh, into contact with the clays this organic matter can be tied up from 10 to a thousand years I got no idea how long the organic matter in this here uh, plant will be tied up in there you know I just am not a researcher so I don't know so I'm just quoting the textbook uh, you know that this lignified plant material it gets clays have a lot of negative uh, charges on the surface and they want to bind with things because they have these negative charges exposed and so they are binding with some of this woody plant material as we have this time goes on and that's when long-term organic matter is made and that is how we can slowly that's how we build our organic matter up is with some of this more woody plant material you know, too as we think about deep roots well yeah they're good we all know they're good we all know we can build deeper organic matter but you know if we don't have these maybe if we don't have these massive root systems on top that are more shallow then we don't get the good infiltration and that is indeed we get more aggregation with these bigger woodier roots there the books are saying we get more aggregation in the soil and sure enough when i dig a, dig beside this plant trying to keep the root out of it you know more of the root out because when you dig it up and you start to going through it, you just tear everything up so you know i'm just trying to dig down beside this you know i'm seeing that the soil is way more highly structured than what it is 
when I dig beside a fescue plant. So I just try to, I try to dig right beside that fescue plant. I'm getting some of the shallow roots, but I'm staying away from that clump of it. And you know, this, the soil, you know, in this here is a lot more highly structured and all this structure then helps with water infiltration. So that as the water, we're holding that water above maybe some less structured soil, but as the roots go deeper, you know, it's, it's able to go down. So it's, it's the, you know, we need more infiltration on the top is what we need to get that, to get the water to go on down. So, the, you know, just to, to kind of quote what the book says, you know, cellulose and lignin, this woody plant material is broken down more slowly. The remaining carbon are modified lignans and newly synthesized organic compounds are chemically protected by conversion into soil humus. And soil humus uh, binds with the clays, increasing the pool of stable organic matter. Humus can be stable in the soil from 10 to 1,000 years. So I think, you know, when we go out on the landscape and we're always hearing problems, you know, my cattle are, are stomping the soil in, they're pugging the soil. So just, just realize now we have more sponge out there in our soil that is more resilient, you know, to the effects of grazing is what this plant, I believe this plant can be, you know, more beneficial to building that organic matter and to, to making our soils more resilient to grazing is what is a, is a big help. So, and of course this humus, it holds water and nutrients. Yesterday I talked a little bit about how some of the native grasses actually fix nitrogen and they need this state with a bacteria. It's not the, a, a symbiotic relationship of the bacteria uh, with these native grasses can fix nitrogen and they do need a steady supply of this woody more this decaying woody organic matter is important you know to that process of these native grasses having the ability to fix nitrogen so there's the there's actually two kinds of, of sunflowers that I that I like to grow there's a lot more sunflowers uh, but there's uh, another thing about the sunflowers that interests me is is they each one kind of has its niche. There's uh, the sawtooth sunflower usually grows in fairly deep, uh, uh, rich prairie soils, good good soils that are that are deeper and usually lower on the landscape. So there's more mesicness, you know, in that landscape is where the sawtooth sunflower grows. I noticed that. Uh, in our soils, when we have a drought, the sawtooth kind of wilts up and it waits till the rain come before it comes back. So uh, I look sometimes at the function of these plants, you know, that in, in that landscape, we have a lot of water in the soil. And if we're not taking water out of the soil, uh, with some of these plants, our deep-rooted native grasses just aren't are having to work harder, you know, to produce. So they like oxygen in the soil. So usually you think about warm season grasses greening up and growing later, and the cool season plant material a little bit earlier. And this here is true with the cool season grasses as well as the sunflowers. But they're, they're, they have a real function of getting the water out of the soil so that air can penetrate into the soil and plants can grow more efficiently. So I think that's one of the functions of these plants. And then when I look at the, the Maximilian sunflower, it grows up on top of the hill in more dry conditions. Now, both of them will grow, in, if you plant them, they will grow in both conditions. So I can plant Maximilian down in the bottom, it'll do great, I can plant the other one up on top of the hill and it'll grow too. It'll wilt a little bit sooner. But I wonder sometimes the, Ma the Maximilian sunflower does not wilt. You know, it is, it's, see, appears to me to be very efficient with water and it keeps on growing and it does not wilt in a drought. So, you know, so its function with where it's growing may be even more important for building organic matter. Uh, you know, I, I don't really know 
And then we throw in another sunflower right behind you guys is a, is a willow leaf sunflower. It has a really narrow, really narrow leaves. And the cattle don't eat that one, so I don't like it. <laughs> and why don't they eat it? I don't really know. So, so that's what I've noted with the sunflowers. And so as you know, we're trying to constantly figure out where these plants go, what their function is you know, in these different systems. And we try to mimic Mother Nature by putting the right plant in the right place. But she really does have quite a bit of flexibility. Plants, plants do have some flexibility. So another amazing plant that I like a lot is this prairie cordgrass. And it was really hard to dig, guys. I hacked on this here for a long time with my Maddox. But this is exactly how it grows in a wet soil. Now this is a warm season grass. So you can see that, uh, gosh, that doesn't have a very deep root system, does it? We were talking about warm season grasses being, you know, deep rooted. But this prairie cordgrass has no reason to have a deep root. Why? It grows in wet soils, it, you know, in these areas where water, uh, you know, runs down the hill and comes out into these springy areas. This is the type of situation that it likes to grow in. So it has fairly shallow roots. And to me, the design of this prairie cordgrass looks like it is designed, you know, it's just like a woven rug to support livestock as they go to water, as they graze. This here will support the livestock. But without this plant, you know, we're going to, we, we don't have that support. So being always wanting to be a cowgirl, I keep looking at for the four functional diversity groups that grow in these different soils. And I've started to play more with the prairie cordgrass here, and so I'm looking for the cool season plants that are growing with it. And sure enough, as, you, as we walk up the valley, you'll see in a wet springy area, I planted some of this prairie cordgrass. This is the second growing season that it's going. And if you look close, you'll see some nodding bulrush, and you will see one of the sedges growing in with those. And sure enough, especially when I look at this prairie cordgrass, and it's kind of hard to, to look at all this, but you'll have just a half inch of soil up on top. You can see it right here. And then you'll have this coarse root system right here. And when there's plenty of water, it seems like in the wetter soils that this prairie cordgrass is growing, I'm gonna see more nodding bulrush, more of these cool season plants you know, growing on top of, of this. And when you look at the openness of this plant, you know, there's, even though it's got a lot of leaves and where it's growing, it's even more open because it hasn't filled in. But there's a lot of sunlight that gets down through these leaves, you know, making it more, making it open. And I'm gonna say, if you have water and sunlight, plants are gonna grow in Missouri. But a lot of times we have to put the seeds in there is what we have to do. This spring here has been bare all my life. And I got to thinking, oh, the first principle of soil health is diversity and no bare ground. Ah, what can I put in there? So I started thinking and, you know, going back to looking at some of the other springs. And, and rather than have watercress, I thought, hmm, that cattle don't eat. What about this prairie cord grass? So, so that's, we're looking at that. We're looking at what different cool season plant material we can grow in these as well. So with that, that's just going underground a little bit, you know, talking about soils and talking about, uh, you know, the functionality of these plants. And I sometimes don't, I, I know we don't appreciate all that's going on underground. In the video description, there are links to other talks from this field day. Justin Thomas shares his thoughts about how nature works. Lauren Steele discusses why a diversity of plants is good for livestock. Elizabeth talks about how a diversity of plants above ground makes for a productive grassland as well as biochar's contribution to organic matter. And Colt Hamilton speaks about establishing a diverse native silvopasture or savanna.